Well, hey, everyone, and welcome. Um, I'm incredibly excited today to have you join us. Um, I'm sitting with my friend, Legend, who uh, heads up the gospel hip-hop production company called the Renaissance Movement, and also a ministry called Expect Renaissance. And I am so excited to have him uh, tell you a little bit about that today and to really showcase some of the incredible things that they're doing. But before we get started, I want to talk just a quick second about kind of how we know, know each other. So Legend, I guess we met probably about five years ago, um, something like that. that. Long? Yeah, it, man, was it that long ago? It probably is. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> it's, it's crazy how, how fast crazy. it goes, man. Kids have yeah. grown up. It, it's, it's wild. These are facts. They have not stopped growing yet. <laughs> But gosh, yeah, I think I was starting a church at a, a college campus and uh, everybody I met just said, hey, if you're going to talk to somebody about reaching college students, you got to talk to legend. You got to talk to legend and just kept <laughs> in the direction. That's crazy. And so eventually our paths crossed. I got to do, I uh, got to see some of the incredible things you were doing through the Renaissance movement. And uh, we got to participate and, and work together on some things. And man, it's just a pleasure to get to reconnect with you again. Uh, hey, bro. Of course, some of you watching this, you might know Legend, you might have seen him, but I will just say personally, you know, what's amazing is not just your talent when it comes to hip hop, but just who you are, man, when it comes to being somebody who's passionate about the Lord and, and doing the work of growing God's kingdom, it's incredible. And, and I'm grateful you, to be able to have this time with you. Thanks for being Same here. Same here, man. Same here, bro. Much respect to you for all the work you did at Ignite and are doing now and how God's moved you into the church you're at. So. I appreciate, man, just knowing you and seeing what you're doing and just how you hold it down. Thanks for, thanks for letting me be here. Hey, it's great, man. I'm glad God, God brought us together. I want to yeah. um, take a moment to begin and just talk a little bit about, you know, the Renaissance movement, expect Renaissance, and let you talk about those. So you've got a gospel hip-hop production company called the mm -hmm. Renaissance Movement. You've got a ministry yeah. called Expect Renaissance. Tell us a little bit about those and, and kind of what that's all about. Sure, sure. So uh, Renaissance is is basically my LLC that I put out music through and I, I get booked as an artist and a speaker through and expect Renaissance is how I do what I talk about in the music. That's where we're in the community. We're doing teaching and preaching. We're doing humanitarian stuff, talking about justice. Uh, so that's how I basically get to do as my ministry branch of what I've always talked about artistically. And that's how the two kind of work in concert. That's great. And so how did this get started? Tell me a little bit about when it all began. Man, yeah, I started doing music. When I, when I got saved, and I was about 15 years ago. So I just I, I just started doing music way back yonder. But then um, I went full time. I was a youth pastor down at First Prayers Norfolk, youth minister down there. And I left that full time seven years ago uh, and, and started to focus on just doing the music and raising the funds to support the ministry so I could focus my energy there full time. Um, and it was always this thread of like renaissance in it because renaissance means rebirth. And that's kind of like what it was. It was a movement of the rebirth Jesus gives through his gospel. So. And that's kind of what it was always about. And then it's either the movement of that or it's expect that to happen when we get this gospel out. So it's all the same. Um, and uh, but that's kind of how it started. And I was all I've always been doing all the same work. I just separated into two organizations. Uh, so I have freedom to flex around the industry and then uh, nonprofit structure uh, for traditional ministry stuff. So that's kind of the uh, so industry and ministry is kind of the two thoughts of why they're both there. But Expect Renaissance is, is giving us opportunity to, you know, go, in, go into a prison, to uh, found the Safe House Project to fight anti-human trafficking, to find, to found the Hampton Road City Collective, which is talking about how to fake leaders dialogue about racial injustice issues, uh, as well as a host of other things, mission trips to Africa, and, and, and put, we produced our own tour that was just preaching the gospel uh, last year, and that went really well. Uh, had two legs of that with multiple stops each. Uh, so I'm able to put put legs to the artistic vision through through the nonprofit Expect Renaissance, and that's uh, and that's just been a blessing to do. That's powerful. And so, what kind of uh, impact have you seen, you know, over the past year, couple of years, as you've been moving forward with this? Oh well, yeah, like like I said, man, just musically, you know, you put out art, and art has a way of captivating people in a way other things do not. Like uh, there's a uh, an old quote that says. Um, uh, art is the most dangerous weapon because it bypasses the senses. It goes straight to the heart, right? Uh, music and stuff like that, right? So uh, then there's, um, um, so that idea that I can put the gospel into music and get into your subconscious and be there, like just happened with all the music listen to anyway. Uh, I just believe the gospel is the only message worth living by. So like uh, at the end, when you compare the worldview, so I, if I can make good art that's infused with gospel messaging, um, I do that. And then, you know, I'm very transparent in my music where I talk about like, my wrestles with believing that I'm good enough 
uh, for God and, and fatherlessness. I grew up without my father, like, and, and drugs situation like that, like that he was on. And so being able to communicate that stuff through uh, the music and be helpful to people that are in that same situation and say, hey, my solution I found in Christ, um, I'm willing to connect with you, whether you know Christ or not, but like, I pray you get to meet him. That's pretty much the music side of it. Then the nonprofit side of it is, well, I care about reconciliation. I care about fatherlessness. How do we put legs to that? So we're putting on shows to try to reach people where they are. We're going to, to do mission trips and places to communicate that same message. And then I see these kids that are unprotected and I'm like, well, what do they need here? And they're like, well, they need a safe house. I'm like, well, let's build one. And so we raise money and do music about that. And then that turns into the safe house project. And that house went up in 2019 in South Africa. And then we launched in 2018, a national effort to focus on America and how do we end it here in America? Um, and that's his own organization now that we still support. I'm on the board on, I'm on the board of, but it came from and launched out of Expect Renaissance. Um, so I've seen that impact as we've added more beds to the national landscape to protect kids that escape sex trafficking, because that comes from our ministry heart of protecting um, the vulnerable children, which comes from my personal heart, from my father, the stuff that I communicate in the music. So like everything's kind of attached to all these different branches, man. Like, um, and as a black man, like when I see racial injustice issues, um, and I, I expect the church to be the, on the front lines dealing with it. Many times it's not, but I expect that because I read the, I read this book, this gospel. And, um, and so like, I'm really, uh, so we start talking about that. What does Jesus have to say about justice? And what does that matter? How does that matter in the kingdom of God? So we make music about it and we, we led a march of 5,000 people in the wake of George Floyd that, that happened in downtown Norfolk saying Jesus and justice are not separate doctrines. Like it's not, it's not separate liberal and conservative. Like what, show me a scripture that backs that view up. Nowhere can you find that. But Jesus talks a lot about justice. Isaiah nine, he's going to, his government's going to be in the show. There's going to be justice and righteousness forever. Like he talks about this all the time. Uh, so that ministry output says we need to talk about this in the kingdom perspective and I'm going to make music about it and I'm going to preach about it. And um, so we find ways to do that. And we've just seen people get hope. We've seen people get clearer perspective. We've seen people um, reevaluate things because it's presented in a different way, whether it's artistically or in a different format or of a different culture. Cause everything I do is steeped in hip hop culture because that's me. Um, but I'm communicating these eternal truths of this gospel that doesn't, that isn't, can, it isn't uh, controlled by culture, but becomes incarnate in it. And and I'm just, uh, you know, just been grateful to see lives changed. Um, people find hope. People find out that God says they're worth it to come to. People get questions answered. People get inspired and motivated. People have a good time at a show and people, um, you know, confess their, their trust in Jesus. So, yeah, And this is just what I love about how God works, right? God takes this this passion to just share the gospel right this good news about jesus and then uses you and, and takes this around the world right and, and changes people's lives in real and powerful and tangible ways and it, it just brings the gospel to life I mean, that's amazing yeah it's been nuts man we just, a lot of it we never saw coming so like it's just you know i'm just i'm grateful to be along for the ride i take take no credit for it man the lord's been faithful if he if he doesn't breathe life into it all of our art and energy and good ideas don't matter so um, I appreciate him allowing us to be a part of this. Yeah, man, I love those words. Like along for the ride, that's exactly what I was thinking. Like we, we just get <laughs> to be a part of what God is doing. It's just, it's amazing. Thanks. So I saw one of your recent videos um, called Feel. And I mean, I gotta be honest, it, it, was, it was a powerful video. Um, and, and if you all watch and haven't Thank seen you. it, I've got the link in the description down below. But you know, tell us, what was some of the inspiration behind this video? Yeah, so 2020 was a weird year, um, you know, and, you know, I'm laying my son down one night and, and I, I was trying to jog because, you know, I'm always trying to, I'm trying to get in shape. I'm on the ebb and flow of like, I'm going to work out. I'm going to eat too much. I'm going to work out. And uh, so uh, I lay my, I started jogging. I laid my son down and he was like, hey, um, when you go jogging tomorrow morning, would you wake me up? And I was like, of course I will. Yeah, we'll do that together. And then I laid him down. I picked up my phone and that's when I found out the news about Ahmaud Arbery's murder. And uh, so I'm looking at it and I'm up till four in the morning scrolling, trying to wrap my mind around what's happening here. Uh, and then I wake up and then I just go for a run to clear my head. And I realize that I didn't wake my son up. And, I, and then as I further dug into the reasons for not waking my son up, uh, I didn't run in fear, but there was this, this shame of, uh, I don't, I have to have conversations with my son that I never wanted to have the same ones my mother had with me. And I, and it just it just took me to how I really feel about 
um, all these situations, how I really feel about Brianna, how I really feel about uh, George, how I really feel about Stephen Clark, how I really feel about Tamir Rice, how I really fear about all these police things. And just keep continuing to talk about this is a consistent pressing issue. Um, and and to be, and then, you know, just the, so I, I wrote it from an apologetic place. I, you know, actually what triggered it is I read, I read a note that somebody wrote that they don't know I read, that I don't, that I don't know I saw um about how they really felt about it and uh, about these issues and they were you know it was you know well you know what are they worried about the police killing them for when they're killing each other? you know that type of rhetoric or whatever that, that kind of gets dismissive um and and it triggered me to the point where i wanted to write a little bit of an, a response so the first verse is really just a response to that kind of thinking that like how how do you justify being dismissive to somebody losing their life no matter how you want to be dismissive to it did somebody or did they not lose their life unjustly? And 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 you you say you're you're reading the same book I am, and you but yet you're being dismissive for political reasons. Um, so that was kind of like I wanted to start there and kind of break things down semi apologetically. But then it was just like, man, this is just really how I feel. Like you can you know if you don't feel the pain of this particular issue, you can debate if it's a thing and if it's media bias da da da. But then you get to go home and walk away from it. I don't get to walk away from it. I got to still look my son in the face and explain this stuff to him. So I've got to either swallow a lot, deal with a lot, process a lot, and feel a lot differently than you do. Um, whether you want to call that privilege or insensitivity, it doesn't matter. Like, I'm not mad if you don't have to deal with it. Matter of fact, I'm happy for you. I'm happy that you get to walk away from it. I don't. So, um, uh, you know, it's really about looking my son and my daughter in the eyes and the conversations I've had to have with them this year that, Maybe I should have had sooner, but I just never wanted to. And I was just feeling sad that I still had to have them uh, and trying to communicate that I only have hope in Jesus, but also that I just, you know, sometimes it just sucks. And I just communicated that, that that feeling sucks. Yeah. And there's some, some really powerful images in this video. You know, there's the image of you in the car with the blood on your chest and on your hand. Mm -hmm kind of a tub full of water. And so just tell us about some of the meanings of those things and, and what you wanted to communicate through that. Sure, man. The, the tub and the water was just the feeling of like, um, just floating, just kind of, you know, just kind of drowning a bit in, in, in the issues itself. And like, um, if you see me here drowning, you're going to come save me. You're just going to kind of look and say, well, you probably, you shouldn't have been in the water if you were going to drown. Like, what are you going to do? So it's kind of that, that piece of it. And, and um, I have a line, that says, uh, I, you know, I was uh, trying to cut from it, come up for air and I ain't make it yet and I was almost there. Then you put your knee right on my neck. And it's kind of that constant reminder that we have an issue. The, the image with the, in, in the car, um, there was the reasons for that. I mean, you could tie it to Philando Castile uh, if you wanted to about that, that image is there. Um, but, you know, we also, I was really clear with our director, Will, and I was like, hey man, like, I want to make sure that we show the injustices done against black people but I want to also uh, tie the injustices done against police officers who are now getting targeted. You know what I'm saying? And and I don't really care what side of the fence somebody's on. Well, if they didn't do this and we didn't, I don't. None of that matters to me. Yeah. There's somebody made in the image of God lose their life. So um, part of that was tied to the the image we showed. The image of of uh, the guy that walked up and shot the officer in the car. Uh, we showed a clip of that. And then um, and so then I'm sitting in the car and I'm kind of saying, look, I don't care who lost their life. If somebody made an image of God lost their life, I, I want to feel this pain and mourn with those who mourn uh, and rejoice with those who rejoice. So being in the car, it could have been me as a cop. It could have been me as a black man. It could be whatever. It was just like somebody lost their life and we should have some sympathy. And that's kind of the point of some of that imagery. It's, it's obviously heavily focused on uh, uh, the injustice of black men in, the, in our country. So obviously heavily focused on that. But that was the reason for that, that part. I wanted to say like, Look, I don't care if you're a cop, okay, if you're white, okay, if you're black, whatever. I don't, I don't want anybody losing their life unjustly. And that was my point. I think that's a powerful image. I mean, because I know that's a, a huge source of contention, but uh, to be able to have that grace in that too, because you could, you could imagine so many artists going in one direction or another and people going one direction or another. But, mm -hmm. but I mean, as Christians, right, we're, we're called to care about anybody who's lost, any life that's yeah. lost. And that, yeah, what grace. Well, so, yeah, the heart of me, man, is just reconciliation and being a bridge builder. So, like, yeah. that's that's something I'm, whether I'm preaching or whether I'm talking about a theological issue that falls on two sides and whether I'm talking about race and politics that fall on these sides. Uh, my goal is how do I, how do I, how do I find the person in the room that's got their arms crossed because they're opposing what I'm saying? 
And how do I disarm them? How do I get them to do that? So I'm always thinking about how do I bring this person to the middle of the room and get them out of the polarized side, no matter who they are, no matter who I'm speaking to, um, no matter what side I'm talking to at the moment. And so a lot of my art imagery and messaging is always like, how do I build a bridge here? So that's a lot of what I try to do. Yeah. So is there a specific message you would say, like you want people to take from this video, walk away, and, and I would love it if you were, if you're thinking this or asking this question, what would that be? Um, I, I guess, I guess that one, it would be, man, just, I don't know if you, whether you, whether you get it or not, just sit and sympathize and feel uh, mm -hmm. that somebody really feels this differently than you. And they don't need your rhetoric. They don't need your argumentation. They don't need your, what about this? Sometimes somebody just needs to know that you care and they don't need a debate. Um, they don't need a debate always. And uh, that, that's kind of where I'm at, man. Just, this is how I'm feeling and just feel this with me. And if you don't feel this with me or you don't care, just walk away. Like, I don't want to talk right now. I'm just in my feelings right now. We can talk another day. Today I'm feeling this. So it's really just get some sympathy for somebody else who doesn't feel the way you do. Yeah. So the mission of, of this channel is to, to really help people grow in their faith and to grow their churches, right? And, oh, and cool. what do you think is the message that the people of the church, right, the people of God who are in the church need to hear in times like we're living in right now? And I have one message for the church uh, right now, and it is repent of political idolatry. Mm. That's my that's my singular message for the church. I'm sure I'm sure it can apply globally, but just our Western church where we are is just repent of political idolatry. What's political idolatry? It's where you glorify or demonize a candidate or another side, and you find your hope in your side. Uh, it's where. Um, the worst example of the other side represents the entire side and the best example of your side represents your entire side because obviously your side's better, otherwise you wouldn't be there. It's really self-serving political idolatry that makes Jesus an additional savior that's a good, that's, that's a cool option, but our political agenda uh, is really where we put our hope and that's idolatrous anti-gospel and I dare say satanic and uh, is steeped in the church and um, it's, 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 it's the... Uh, it's the uh, deceitfulness of the heart when you don't recognize how wicked it is, but it's right there. It's when somebody is on Facebook as a church member, a lay leader or a pastor, and they, got, they have a greater apologetic for their candidate than they do for their Christ. That's political idolatry. Um, and I'm sick of it and it's frustrating and it's disgusting and it sickens me. Uh, and I get really sad when I see it and I pray for us to repent, burn that idol, crash it, and, and, and turn to our first love. We might find there's somebody in another church that's on a, of a different wing than we are, or a different side, they vote differently. We might find out that they don't hate babies. We might find out that they don't hate black people. We might find out they actually have an answer to the solution from the vantage that they have that you don't have because you have a certain vantage and you actually needed them to get done what you wanted to get done in the first place. Um, so my, my goal, man, is just, Repent of political idolatry because you can't have a one-sided gospel. You can't have a one-sided kingdom. There is not going to be, KB said it in his album, there's not going to be a left or right side of heaven. Uh, but we live like it here and then expect to get into heaven that, that everything's just going to be, um, you know, we're not going to just see left wing, right wing heaven. So like we have to stop this buffoonery and repent of it. And um, I don't care who takes offense to that, repent. Absolutely. I mean, that's one of the things. And I've talked about on this channel a bit before is that it's so often we, we forget who our savior is. All right? We start thinking that this politician or this person over here is the person who's going to save us. And if they just get elected, then, then everything's going to be better. And, and we yeah. kind of just leave Jesus out of it altogether. Yeah. There's no scripture where Jesus said, don't worry, guys. Once we get this emperor in there, it's going to be okay. Like, <laughs> it's not a single passage. It's frustrating to me. I don't, I, vote i'm not anti i mean man praise god we have the right um do it do your thing but just god man hope in 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 people and parties and policies is like that is not what this book says no. ever um and it frustrates me the amount of energy we we allow ourselves to put into it uh we get tossed back and forth with every wind of doctrine politically um even if we're solid in our gospel we let that happen it, the scripture still applies so I'm just like, um, just if, if we don't repent of political idolatry, all is lost because we put something in front of our savior anyway, and yeah. it doesn't matter. Absolutely. You know, one of the things I, I keep hearing um, 
in the times that we're living in, in, in the midst of, of everything we're seeing on the news and everything going on in our country is when it comes to issues of race and justice, I hear Christians asking mm -hmm. like, you know, what can I do, right? I know our church has wrestled with this. There's this injustice that exists out there. We want to respond as a church, but what do we do? And so what would, what would your advice to churches be of like, where can you begin as a church to, to reach out and, and be a part of, of addressing issues of injustice and, and race in our culture right now? Sure. I mean, I, I would just say, man, like lear learning and teaching uh, you know, each other what's going on, like learning about uh, mass incarceration issues, learning about privatized prison, uh, things like that. Like, why do we, why does that even exist in our country? Learning about certain political sways and certain agendas like Southern strategies and war on crime and law and order and what those trigger words actually resulted in and what they mean. Um, you can't, if you point to the night, if you're, if you're conservative and you point to Joe Biden for the 1994 crime bill, did you care about it before he was running against Trump or did you care about what that actually meant when, when it was a thing, right? And so that's, that's an issue. And if, if you're, if you're, you know, pro, uh, you know, all the conservative things, look at like the Nixon Reagan era and what that turned into and what that meant for people. And look at the, look at the war on drugs versus the war on opioids and see the drastic different, different response. And you have to, you know, you got to look at redlining and the results of redlining and what that turned into. And, and you, and this is right in our faces, but we, uh, many times we just sit back and say, well, because it doesn't fit my side, I don't have to deal with it. So my challenge for the church would be like, talk about these things, teach about these things from a holistic vantage point. Um, talk about black on black crime, talk about abortion, talk about what that means, but talk about it holistically, not from a polarized vantage point. Like the, the abortion conversation, the conservative side is absolutely correct. This is a racial conversation. If we wanna look at Margaret Sanger, eugenics, the Negro project, we have to talk about that. But don't only talk about that because that fits your side and then leave the rest out, right? So um, that's, we don't talk about the fact that there are more white babies aborted than black but we talk about the disproportionate number of blacks aborted to white because it fits our side of the race conversation. For, talk about the whole thing. The church has to, has to preach and teach holistically, holistically on what's going on. And then show the gospel's response to how Jesus dealt with uh, issues of genderism and racism and sexism and all that stuff. He, he dealt with it all. We have, we've had the answer for two millennia. He dealt with it and how he responded, how he responded to politics, how he responded to so just have a holistic, gospel apologetic that fits all the things and teach and talk about the the triggers that people oh don't talk about that that's political well not talking about it is also political so what do you want to do do we want to do we want to talk about the kingdom or do we want politics to determine what we do or don't lift up i'm 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 pro i'm pro-life and i'm pro-racial justice what which party do i go to and what church do i worship at mm -hmm. you feel what i'm saying like yeah it's, there shouldn't even be a conversation. So churches have to holistically address these things with the gospel and teach their people to say, listen, remove your political blinders and just look at this for what it is and be willing to listen to teachers who aren't in your camp, be willing to listen to positions that don't fit your side and then take those things to scripture and say, what is the, what is the whole corpus of scripture have to say about this without these other influences and deal with it that way and teach your church to do the same. Surprisingly, the practical answers start to emerge. Because if you try to do practical answers without doing that hard work, then you just find yourself ticking boxes uh, that, that feel like you did something. And then when there's no cultural conversation about it, the energy fades and the emphasis fades. Um, so could you go get a, a, a black friend and get a good relationship? Could you go get a right friend? Absolutely, I think those things should be done. I care more about who's at your dinner table than who's in your pews, personally. Um, cause who's in your dinner table is going to affect who's in your pews. I think, oh, that's great. I think you should diversify your leadership. I think you should bring people in to speak who come from, I think you should do all of that. But I think that's second and third tier from the very hard work of eliminating, um, the larger influences that really affect our decisions and our sway. And we've got to start to peel back the layers of idolatry that we've all allowed, everybody's done, all allowed to influence our decisions as it relates to justice, mercy, and race in our country. Because we have to be honest and say, we planted some seeds a very long time ago that as a country that we're, that we're dealing with now. And as beautiful as our creeds and our flag and our freedoms are, 25% of the world's population being incarcerated in the land of the free and the home of the brave, something is wrong. Yeah. And we've got to deal with it. And the only people who can deal with it are the people who believe the gospel of reconciliation 
period, right? Uh, so we can't, we, we, if anybody can't afford to have their heads in the sand on their polarized side, it's us. So we've got to start there. And then the practical, the practical emphasis is work themselves out. I don't know if that was helpful or not. No, it's incredible. <laughs> and I think it leads into a, a question I've been struggling with um, when I talk to people. You know, what, what would you say to people who say, I just don't see the connection between my faith and issues of race and justice? I just don't see what that has to do with my believing in Jesus and getting into heaven. Yeah, sure. Absolutely. Partially, um, you know, at, there's, there's a struggle I have with that, too. There's par partially, there's a part of that that's, that's correct, I think. But um, I think on a, the meta narrative is, I would say, um, well, what are the things that you find as a connection between your faith and other issues that you do see as a connection? And then you have to ask yourself, why do you see that as a connection versus this? Um, why do you see a connection between your faith and this issue, your faith and this practice? And those things make sense. Now, then you got to step, step back and look at them and say, well, do these things I do see a connection of fit a certain side? a certain liberal sway or a conservative sway, a certain theological sway, a certain denominational cultural sway. Oh, it's, and then you probably will start to find out that the things you do see a connection with fit a side that you're on in some way. And the things you don't see a connection with are things you never talk about, deal with, or have to face. And now you've got to ask yourself, well, have I only connected my faith to a portion of reality? Um, so that's, that's the, that's the thing you really got to sit back on. So uh, to your, to your me getting into heaven piece, there's a side of that that's true. So here's my thought. Um, the Bible says very clearly, believe in your mouth, confess with your heart, right? I mean, believe in your heart, confess with your mouth, right? You say, uh, it doesn't say believe in your heart, confess with your mouth and get these issues correct 100%. So there, we don't have a salvation by works. So my, you know, my thing is this, uh, I, suppose I'm a racist. I don't like this type of person. I don't like, uh, you know, Hispanics, right? Um, I, I genuinely, uh, see that sin is an issue and I've offended God and Christ is the solution. And I, I believe in the historical biblical Jesus. I repent of my sins as best as I can cognitively see him now. Obviously with the deceitfulness of the heart, Jeremiah, I don't, I don't know the whole list of my sins. I don't see my pride every day, but I'm, you know, I'm going to do this. And I turn and I trust Jesus. And according to scripture, I've been redeemed and saved. And now I get to walk out this process of sanctification, right? Whatever, whatever. Um, I'm a year into my, my new faith walk. I'm still mean sometimes. Man, I cheated on my taxes. I felt a little better about it than I did the year before, but I still did it. But I really trust, you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. I'm on my way. Uh, <laughs> you know, five years from now, I don't cheat on my taxes anymore. I'm a little nicer. But I've never fixed this thing about how I feel about Mexicans. I'm on my way, but I just, I just, I won't shop at that store because there's a bunch of them there and I'm still kind of a little racist about that. But I really, I'm, but I'm on my way. Before right. I get to year 10, when I would have, you know, realized how stupid I was being, I get hit by a bus and now I got to face the judge. Does he say, you know what? Um, you did confess, to, you did believe in your heart, confess in your mouth, but you never fixed that, how you fix, feel about Mexicans. So I can't let you in. I don't see that in the scripture. And that's hard for me because as much as I care about justice, I want racism to be the impardonable sin. I do. I don't want you to make it in if you don't like me. You know what I'm saying? Um, yeah. But that's then then what about the people that i don't like that i don't recognize consciously that i'm doing the same thing too now i've disqualified myself so I, I just feel like um there's a portion of that that's correct but uh as a connection of i don't see how i feel about race being connected to my faith you have to ask yourself well do you see everybody made an image of god yeah of course i do do you really or do you just you've memorized genesis one through three and you have to say that um because when somebody dies that's connected to your side you feel some mourning when somebody dies who does, who's not connected to you in any way, you keep scrolling or you flip the channel. Something's wrong, and all of us do that. So you got to look at it that way. Yeah. So, so in light of that, you know, how would you say that, that that maybe connects with what the Renaissance movement is doing and expects Renaissance? What would you say is, is up ahead for you in the future um, through Expect Renaissance and the Renaissance movement? Yeah, bro. So COVID's been fun, obviously. Uh, it killed, killed my whole travel schedule. Um, but yeah. uh, we, we um, so it, it caused us to pivot and figure some things out. So I'm releasing a ton of new music. I release music all year. It's great. Some about this topic of justice, some about uh, some general things. I've got a lot of music coming next year. But the coolest thing is I was able to do a virtual concert that started on November 17th. 
and we're going to air an encore. I haven't announced it yet, so you're the first public announcement. We're going awesome. <laughs> to so privileged. Going to air it again on January the twelfth. Um, yeah, man, you know. Uh, so we're going to air it again January twelfth, and and uh, and that virtual concert was ama- It was amazing. Like because we knew it was all virtual, we had to do so much work on the production end that we ended up with like a TV award show quality type, you know, thing. There's like brass sections and band and lights and big screens. It's crazy. Um, so that was fun, man. And so we're going to encore that on the 12th and then we're going to, we're going to, we're putting a lot into a quarterly, um, strategy to, to drop virtual concerts next year. So putting a lot into that, um, I'm relaunching my podcast, the fear not podcast, uh, sometime top of next year. And, uh, and also going to be, um, just focusing on dropping a lot of content, a lot of messages, a lot of sermons and, um, reaching people digitally best we can. Um, and, you know, going wherever God will allow us to go as long as it's safe and, and lit and wise. So, yeah. I love it, man. I can't wait to see it. Um, that's awesome. Thanks, so man. then I guess my last question is if people want to support you and what you guys are trying to do, um, what can they do? How can they do that? Yeah. Uh, thanks, man. Um, if, if somebody was to go to legend.tv, not .com, but .tv, like television, uh, that's my site. And there's a bunch of stuff up there. Uh, music and merch and all those things. If somebody wants to look at, uh, just find out what's going on, you can join the email list. You can join uh, that. You can follow me on social media at Legend TV, L-E-G-I-N TV, uh, on, at wherever you get social media from. And I'll keep you posted on what's happening there. Um, if you want to support the nonprofit Expect Renaissance, you can visit expectrenaissance.org. And there's a giving link for our 501c3, uh, some stuff. We're, we're revamping the website. I've got a big meeting next week about all that. So uh, it's going to be, uh, it's going to be, it's going to be look really cool by the end of the year, but um, you can visit that, hit me up with any questions and there's a end of the year, you can do end of the year giving there. And we're going to put a lot of work into getting the gospel out effectively into culture in 2021, teach people how to lead through tough issues like race and other things uh, best we can and put out a lot of great artistic content to reach people in their heart. So. I love it, man. I can't wait to see what you guys put out. That That's incredible. Um, Thanks bro. So if you're watching, you know, and, and you guys are interested in any of this, go to legend.tv and uh, we'll put some links down below so you make sure to have access to that. But, but definitely support Legend and everything that they're doing at Expect Renaissance and the Renaissance Movement. Legend, thank you so much for, for being with us today and just taking this time out. I know you're a busy guy, and so I really do appreciate it. Hey, none, bro. Appreciate you, Brandon. Thanks for letting me be here. Before you go, can I pray for you and for everything Please. God's doing through you? Please. Let's pray. Please. God, I give you thanks for legend. I give you thanks for allowing our paths to cross and using the both of us uh, and the incredible work that you want to do in your kingdom. And I just thank you for, for the ways that you have taken this ministry and spread it around the world, the way that you are changing lives, the way that uh, a legend is speaking truth. And God, your truth is coming through his words, through his music, through moments like this. And God, we ask that your Holy Spirit will just begin to change hearts that we will see a renaissance, we will see a transformation of hearts throughout this country, throughout this world, that our culture might change. And then we might see the great commandment lived out, God, that we will love you, that people will love you with their heart, soul, and strength. That We will love our neighbors as ourselves, and we will see your kingdom begin to spread among us. Thank you for letting us be a part of that. And thank you for Legend and his incredible ministry. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.